Hey, John Piller here. Uh, PLC Basics. Uh, introduction to PLC. I've been asked a few times, what is PLC? Why is it not a computer? What does it do? Uh, that's what this uh, set of slides, that's what this recording is supposed to be doing for us. And uh, hopefully this helps you out. PLC stands for Programmable Logic Controller. It's a compact, programmable device used to control systems and processes. This is the workhorse of industry. This is the thing that is in the machine that makes the machine do its work. This is the brains to the brawn of a factory machine. So whatever you think a factory looks like, this is the control that runs that. This is not the control that runs the robot. This is the control that tells the robot to do its job. This is not the control that runs uh, your data collection system. While it can be part of a data collection system, this is simply running the machine that it is charged to do. It doesn't do any more than that. It doesn't care about anything outside of that. It doesn't care if you're uh, looking at its memory and pulling information. The programmable logic controller is a device that simply runs its logic. It does its job. The most basic level of what a PLC is, is an embedded processor. It runs firmware. There is no operating system on it. It is just straight firmware. The PLC requires a specific IDE uh, to be programmed on the, that machine. Uh, so what we're talking about is when you buy a Rockwell processor, you need to buy Rockwell programming software. You buy a Siemens processor, you buy Siemens programming software. It gets very expensive very fast. So when you ask, why isn't uh, indu uh, industrial controls guy number one always use Rockwell? Well, because he's invested five grand, 10 grand in software to supply his customers with that. That is what it is. And that's an annual cost, right? Um, so there's changes, there's other places where you can do this, but that's the idea. That's why somebody says, I'm an Allen Bradley guy, that's what it means. Somebody says he's a Siemens guy, that's what it means. Uh, so that's what we do in the uh, PLC world. So outside of that, a PLC and its firmware, what does it mean to be a PLC? So I got a processor, I might have a FPGA, I might have an Intel processor. It doesn't matter when I program it to be an, a PLC, I put firmware onto it that uh, does one thing and one thing only. It has the PLC read the inputs. This cycle says uh, execute the program, I usually say, it does its logic, so it reads its inputs, does its logic, writes its outputs, does some overhead, reads its inputs, does its logic, writes the outputs, does some overhead, and again, and again. So here's the big question I ask my students usually, is if I'm in the process of executing a program, or I'm writing my outputs, or I'm doing this overhead, and an input changes, here's the big deal, the PLC doesn't care. It didn't happen. I wasn't looking. If I'm not looking at it, it doesn't matter, okay? So that's what the scan cycle is. It doesn't matter how fast your processor is. The scan cycle is dependent upon how many inputs does it have to look at? How many lines of logic do you have me to do? How many outputs does it have to update? What overhead do you want me to do? That is the scan cycle. This is the thing that a machine is dependent on, on how fast it goes, which is then defining the cycle time of the machine creating widgets, right? So that in of, of itself is what I care about as a controls engineer. I ask the process engineer, what is your cycle time? What do you need to do? And I have to make sure that I design my scan cycle so that I meet that need. Okay, so that's different than what a, um, a computer program would care about, right? The speed of ex execution, that's not where we're at. That's a PLC. And again, like I said, the PLC just does its job. It's a soldier. 
I tell it to do this job, it does this job. It is the control of that machine. It does not care about anything outside of its inputs, its logic, and its outputs, okay? It doesn't care if you look at its memory, and that's where data collection comes from. It can sit there and do its job. Let it do its job. It was designed to do this thing. The manufacturer makes widgets, so the PLC does its job. It makes that. But if you want to then say, hey, the manufacturer wants this other information, that's great. Go ahead and pull it out of the PLC while the PLC is doing its job. Do that. There's, certain, there's ways for that. So let's do that. Now, if you want to change it, well, that's different. You, you know, we've got some other things that are going on there. That's a different conversation. But we're just talking about how a PLC works. That's what a PLC does. All right. I want to show a little bit of picture here so you get an idea of what we're looking at. So right here, here's a PLC. This happens to be an older model of a MicroLogix. You don't really buy those anymore, but they're still out there. Here's a couple I.O. cards that are attached to it. Here's some I.O. And I.O. means input outputs. I.O. that is on board on this MicroLogix uh, processor setup. And then I have some extra uh, I.O. that's sitting out here uh, for other devices. We've got some Ethernet going on in here, some basic relays that are doing some smart things. This is a safety relay. That is very important. We're going to talk about that a little bit here along the way. Here's a DC power supply. This DC power supply is running uh, this whole system here going on. We've got some IO terminals that are connecting to my inputs and outputs and connecting out to the real world going on here. This claims this is an IO cards. I'm not really sure what this is doing. Uh, I may or may not have borrowed this drawing from someone else. Uh, here is some circuit breakers going on, turning everything on and off. This is the master circuit breaker coming in. So this this uh, little bar going right here is actually going out to the door. You gotta turn that off, which cuts the uh, three phase power coming into this so that I can work on this system. Again, if I am work, if I cut that power off, none of this is actually energized, so that's a problem. Uh, that's a different issue to deal with though. But this guy right here is a, is a larger relay, uh, multi, multi-pulled uh, higher power relay going on here. So a PLC, may not be smart. It's only as smart as the logic I tell it to do, but it lifts heavy things. It does heavy things, right? So it is the brains to the brawn in the, in the manufacturing facility, okay? All right, a little bit of history. Where did the PLC come from? Why do we have it today? Why didn't we just use a computer, all right? Well, we start with, we did use computers, and I'm gonna challenge that we don't use computers. We always use computers. Everything is a computer. It doesn't mean that it has a little processor on it that we think of as a computer. A computer is a device that takes an input, does some logic, sets some outputs, right? That computes, hence the term computer. We had relay logic back in the day before PLCs. Look at that. That would be awesome to have to program. No, not at all. But relay logic means that if the switch turns on the coil of the relay, some outputs open or outputs close on that relay, which then activate other relays that then allow other things to happen. This is how Henry Ford set up his line. Back in the day, he used relay logic. This is how we did manufacturing in industrial lines all the way through until the 60s and even into the 70s, sometimes into the 80s. I've run into machines today that are, well, okay, so 20 years ago I ran into machines that were still this way. Um, I personally wired up systems uh, when I was working in uh, correctional facilities that had relay logic. There's a reason for relay logic along the way. Here's another example of some wiring, look at, they were even soldering these devices uh, back there in the day. Uh, some solder suckers up there on the top, look at that. Some old, I've got those, I've got this soldering iron, and yeah, absolutely, uh, we would do this uh, type of work. Uh, here's some more, uh, I call these Frankenstein relays, but uh, they're open contact, you know, kind of a deal going on in this uh, setup. Looks like, uh, yeah, these big fuses going on here fun things. More, I think this is almost the exact same panel as the last one, but better lighting. Uh, so there you go. Okay. Relay logic is complex to wire. It's difficult to troubleshoot. It draws a lot of power. It is energy hog. 
but it does its job. When it's wirely and proper, wired properly and properly maintained, it's reliable. There are reasons for it, and most assuredly, it physically removes the electrical connection. This is important because we use it in safety circuits. NFPA 79 talks about three types of stop. There's a stop zero, stop one, and stop two. So stop two is just a turn off and turn back on, but stop one and zero, those are emergency stop circuits. And depending on why you do a one or a zero, that's a different topic. But what that does is physically removes the power from the actuators. And that's relay logic. Relay logic exists even in the most advanced uh, machine. And that's because it's in the safety circuit. Other systems, systems that are just simple. I don't need to put a processor on this system. It's simple. It just has to work, require minimal maintenance. A furnace in the standard American home is a relay logic. Now, okay, so we've got fancier ones, but the basic simple furnaces out there are just relay logic. Turn it on because the thermostat said so. Go ahead and fire up the fire or the electric or whatever you do. Fire the blower. Thermostat says turn off. Turn off the heat source. Continue to blow until you blow out the heat and then wait. That is a simple circuit. Another one, uh, your your um, lights, uh, night nighttime dusk lights, you know, little photo cell says, hey, it's uh, the sun's not up anymore. Light turns on. Hey, the sun's up, light turns off. That's relay logic. That's that simple. Other uses of relay logic, wells, in your house uh, at the bottom of the well is a pump um, so I'm sitting here not in the city I'm in the county I've got a pressure switch sitting on my uh, plumbing system uh, when somebody turns on a faucet somebody's taking a shower the pressure in the, in the system starts to go down as it goes down the switch kicks in and pumps the water up brings it up to the well pressurizes at the house gets to a point where it's at pressure and then stops turns off the pump and again, you continue with your shower and then you just continue with this process of going through up and down, running the pump. Sump pumps in the house, same idea, except instead of pressure, we're looking at level of float, right? The input in this position. So as this float switch uh, goes uh, from uh, the level of the water, it's up here at high, it kicks in, turns on the pump, the pump pulls the water out of the sump, the float goes down, turns off the pump, continues that process same kind of idea but different uh, just just all across the board so where did the PLC come from it came from ladder logic right it came from relay logic that's that's the whole idea uh, Richard Morley Bedford Associates invented uh, the PLC back for GM you can go look all that up but that's what we we came to a point of doing all this relay logic, it had to be a better, easier way, and they developed the PLC. The PLC took in inputs, ran some logic, did some outputs. From that, they also invented the ladder logic because the people that were wiring that relay logic had a schematic and how it looked. The relay logic looks like the schematic that those electricians and those mechanics were using. So you use the, the force, uh, labor force that they had available to them and their capability of, of writing the code. You know, back in the day, these guys were using uh, <clears throat> um, Pascal and Cobalt and all that writing. You know, nobody wanted to do that. You weren't going to teach an electrician how to do that. But you can take that information, make it a little bit graphical and uh, allow the electrician to go ahead and program the PLC. So there you go, the history of the PLC. So now we're in a PLC. Now we've been around for a while, so what can we program with it? Or how do we program with it? Well, ladder logic, right? But there's also structured text, function block diagrams, instruction lists, and sequential function charts. So what does that mean? So um, IEC 6113-3 describes international standards for PLC programming languages. U.S. subscribes to this, the world subscribes to this, uh, and um, these are essentially the uh, four 
instruction types that, that can be done. This is the exact same logic, what you're seeing in front of you, for uh, each of those setups. Uh, ladder logic makes a lot of sense to me. This one is is uh, when this one is true and that one's not true, we go ahead and activate that output. This is, this makes sense to me also when I think about my digital circuits that I did back in the day. This is true, not that is true. This becomes a, uh, the output. This becomes true. Uh, instruction lists are a little different, but here's structured text. Uh, if C is equal to A and not B, there you go. And then sequential function chart is kind of like a state machine. Uh, that's what goes on with that condition. Again, some more uh, more looking at more uh, uh, difficult ladder logic here, uh, more complicated. So I could turn this on manually. Or the gantry right is true, and the gantry right is true, and that inspects out. You know, this is kind of a deal here. Here's some uh, continuous function chart, again, going through here. Function blocks going through, and some structure. All of this is doing the same logic. Now I want to talk to the question of, I've heard this term PLC, great, awesome pillar, you've told me what that is. But I've also heard perhaps maybe a PAC, uh, but I've also heard, definitely heard of an IPC. So what's the difference here? Well, PLC already told you, it monitors inputs, it does logic, it sets outputs and repeats. Uh, but so does a PAC and so does an IPC. They're all the same. They're the same thing. Little difference. The PAC, the process automation controller, is kind of an outdated term. It talked about, all right, so the PLC does this ladder logic, this very basic relay spice. I want to do a little bit more than that. I want to do some higher level capacity. Well, PLCs can do higher level capacity programming now. There are PIDs on PLCs. I use them all the time uh, for PIDs. I've got a processor out there that I can have up to 2,000 PIDs simultaneously running. That's amazing that it does this. Um, but so if I was going to call out a pack today, I would think about like a lab view. Uh, set up in in a uh, in a chemistry lab kind of setup. You know, if you've got some uh, USB I/O that plugs into your PC and you run some lab view, some basic uh, logic like that. You know what? A pack is actually a lot like uh, the Lego Mindstorms. Uh, that's a pack kind of a setup, uh, kind of a deal. All right, so an IPC, so an industrial PC, or uh, it's 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 a PC. It runs a uh, little computer. Uh, it runs an OS, like uh, Windows, Linux, this kind of thing. Uh, we can program with uh, straight-up regular code, right? It's cool. Uh, I won't lie. I'm a little iffy on these. I've been around for a long time, and uh, back in the early 2000s, Alan Bradley was selling us a soft PLC. It was perfect. It was going to run on a Windows machine. It was great. Um, and I acknowledge a Windows machine versus this little IPC is a little different. This is industrially hardened. It's ready to go. It's supposed to just do its job, but uh, it's running Windows. And so there's that issue. Everything that uh, Windows might do, uh, this machine might do. It might crash. It might fall, you know, these kind of things. Uh, uh, PLCs do not do that because it's just running its firmware. Uh, that being said, uh, the IEC 613 uh, uses, uh, has set up CodeSys, and again, you can use all the kind of different programming languages, but you can also program C and all these other pieces. Uh, there's a Beckhoff, there's a BNR, there's uh, the Opto 22, there's a few others out there. Um, and I'm really interested in where they belong in the ecosystem. Okay, so the PLC, the PAC, the PAC is the PLC, um, and then the IPC. So basically we have the PLC and the IPC currently out there uh, pretty much doing its job. <laughs> um, I, uh, it belongs in the right ecosystem. So here's kind of a little layout of the ecosystem. Where do you put a IPC? Where do you put a PLC? How do you lay it out? Um, they're all tools of the controls engineer and they're tools of the process engineer and they're tools of now whatever we're going to call the person that is dealing with the data in the cloud. Um, and each of them belong within the ecosystem of manufacturing. So hopefully this kind of laid out. Um, it's still just relay logic. Uh, you just use the tool that you need. And we have a Swiss Army knife of options. So there you go. Hopefully this helped. I appreciate it. Uh, 
and uh, let me know if there's anything we can do. Thank you, sir.